Welcome back. Well, the Bush administration's approach to the crisis in Pakistan isn't the only one on offer. One senator, Joe Biden, has his own plan. Biden is calling for President Bush to intervene directly by applying more pressure on President Musharraf. At the same time, Biden says the U.S. must build a new relationship with what he calls the moderate majority in Pakistan and end its over-reliance on the military. For that, Biden says the U.S. should provide unconditional financial support for civilian projects such as schools, roads and clinics. But when it comes to security aid, Biden insists that any aid should be tied to specific performance measures, namely the return to democracy and fighting extremism. Well, we're still joined by our guest in Islamabad, Maktoum Babar, the Daily Times editor-in-chief, and he's also the founder and president of the Daily Mail. In Washington, D.C., Marco Vicenzino, the founder and executive director of the Global Strategy Project. And in Dubai, Javed Malik, a Pakistan expert and the executive director of the Dubai-based The World Forum. Mr. Babar, in Islamabad, if I could start off with you in the second half, what do you make of the Biden plan? In, in the first half of the show, you said that this is an internal matter with regards to Pakistan, the U.S. shouldn't interfere. But Biden's also talking about social reconstruction. What do you make of that? Well, uh, and interfering into uh, political matters or official matters is something different. And giving some suggestion regarding some social measures, this is totally something different. The problem here in Pakistan is that the Pakistanis can may welcome any suggestion for their own development or for their own uh, welfare, but it should not be from America. This is a psychological problem here or whatsoever. So the best thing for Americans is that whatever they, they want to gain in Pakistan, they should simply convey it to the concerned quarters instead of making an open interference. Just look at the Benazir Bhutto incident. Why her popularity tumbled down in days? Because once it was uh, disclosed that she's having support from the United States or something that America is backing her, 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 demo, her uh, popularity graph really went down to a reasonable extent. And uh, that is uh, how they should be, the Americans or the Biden plan, whatsoever they are, they should not be uh, forced as a direct interference into some internal matters of the sovereignty of a sovereign state. All right, uh, in Washington, D.C., uh, Marco Vicenzino, are there plans underway, not only from the U.S., but from other countries for a post-Musharraf Pakistan? I think in the process they're preparing, but they don't know exactly what to prepare for. I think there's largely a disconnect between uh, many foreign policy establishments in the West and what's really going on in the ground within Pakistan itself. Uh, you have Mr. Joe Biden that you mentioned. It's very important to understand that Mr. Biden is a presidential candidate, so he's speaking in campaign mode right now. Much of what he says, there might be validity to what he says, but much of it is geared towards a domestic audience here in the U.S. He has to use assertive language. Uh, but I think the tendency here in Washington is to underestimate the level of political maturity within Pakistan. There have been many problems in Pakistan, and to say there are problems is an understatement, but there's also a vibrant press, uh, an assertive judi judiciary, as we've seen, and also a vibrant public political discourse. Uh, but I think the outside powers, in terms of what they can see going on in the ground, uh, their options are not only very limited, but I think there's a very poor understanding of what's going on in the ground. Javed Malik, do you believe that Musharraf's Pakistani army is winning or losing in the northwest tribal regions on the border with Afghanistan? Well, that's a very important question, but you have to draw a distinction between uh, the Pakistan army and General Musharraf, although he does lead the army, but he has a dual role. He's also the president, well, uh, controversially elected uh, by parliament. But in terms of the war on terror, uh, the war on terror, um, there is also a misunderstanding that every problem that has happened on the tribal belt has been sort of uh, put in the closet of the war on terror. The situation in Swat, which is one uh, northern area in Pakistan, has, is completely different. If you compare it with the other extremist elements in Waziristan, which are, of course, the uh, remnants of the post-Soviet Afghanistan, 
So there are different situations, but what has happened here is that they have been dealt with by one blanket strategy, whereas uh, people do feel that that was perhaps wrong, and uh, one has to understand the ground realities before. But I'm not a military expert over here, but people do feel that perhaps negotiations and dialogue was a measure that could have been exploited, that could have been better exploited had there been a legitimate civilian government oh, I'm which sorry was to interrupt uh, you, but representing do you, the do you feel? I'm sorry to interrupt you, but do you feel that as long as he is deemed as winning uh, in the war on terror, uh, then he'll always have the supports of the United States. Well, um, if that happens, then, uh, you know, again, you have to understand whether the relationship is between one person and the, the U.S. or with, with the people of Pakistan. You talked about the Biden plan where you mentioned uh, getting together a group of moderate people. Everybody in Pakistan is moderate. There are very few people who may be called extremists, and they're also remnants of what has happened in the past in the USSR and uh, the American involvement in that region. But in terms of uh, General Musharraf, yes, he is uh, fighting the war on terror, but he also has to have the support of his people to continue on that war. What I'm trying to say here is you need to have a government that is representative of its people and then all the objectives, whether American or Pakistani or joint uh, uh, sort of interests, can be dealt, better dealt with by a democratic government. Marco Vicencino, does the fact that Pakistan has nuclear weapons raise the stakes and anxiety, particularly for neighbors like India, if the current turmoil continues? I mean, that's one of the driving, I would say, one of the driving factors in the U.S. psyche right now vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan and the region. You mentioned 160 people, access to nuclear weapons, uh, you know, extremist movements, like uh, not everyone, but there are a few, but very well organized. If you have chaos, and plus there's the fact that it, with the bordering, the, much of the international effort in Afghanistan, uh, much of it's dependent upon assistance and help from Pakistan. So as a result, all of this, th these factors are the reasons why, I'd say, security concerns are the main priority in Washington at the present time. Obviously, they, they want to have somewhat of a perception that the U.S. is not backing a military dictator. When I say they're trying to strike this balance, that's something that goes to the core of U.S. foreign policy in recent, recent years. They're dealing in many societies where you have these individuals such as autocrats or individuals who they depend upon largely because they don't understand the realities on the ground. So you have short-term security interests, but long-term uh, democratic things that evolve over time. And striking that balance is something that the U.S. foreign policy establishment, the State Department, is struggling in many, many places beyond Pakistan at the present time. Maktoum Baba, come January the 9th, Musharraf has promised elections. What do you project? Uh, give me your best case scenario and worst case scenario. Oh, first of all, I, can, <clears throat> I would like to add to your last question that uh, it's not only that India is bothered about the state of uh, emergency in Pakistan, the political state. Pakistan is also much concerned about the possession of nuclear weapons by India because they, are, they have failed to come up uh, to prove themselves as a responsible nuclear state. Last year, a whole container of carrying uranium was stolen in India, and so far it is not known where this uh, uranium has Ab gone. Absolutely, sir, but this, we're failed. talking about Pakistan who are under a state of emergency. Come January the 9th, are you optimistic or pessimistic? We are very much optimistic here. As President Musharraf has announced that uh, the election would be held before January 9th by the first week of uh, January, most probably. And uh, we, we, we can, today we, some editors were sitting and we were just discussing who will be the chief minister in Punjab or who will be the chief minister in Sindh. We were not discussing that would the election be held or not. So people in general, they are very much optimistic about a smooth transition of the third phase of democracy that the President Musharraf has been talking about. And uh, I, I don't think that unless, unless there is something major. All right, I'm sorry to interrupt you because I want to get Javed Malik. He's shaking uh, his head in Dubai. Mr. Malik, there's about 45 seconds left on the show, sir. Well, uh, I, I respect Mr. Barber's opinion, but uh, you have to understand how the elections are held, which is very important. Both the opposition leaders, the majority of the opposition, have demanded for the Chief Justice and the judges to be restored. They've also asked for an ind independent election commission, and also the voter list issue has to be resolved. You cannot just hold elections which, are, which have the prerequisites of an election, but not the actual spirit of democracy. You have to have a very fair and impartial judiciary, which is currently in turmoil. You cannot have elections with a judiciary in turmoil, I'm afraid.
All right, Javed Malik, thank you very much. That was very brief. Thank you for that. In Islamabad, Washington and Dubai, all our guests, thank you very much for joining us. And thank you so much, the viewer, for joining us here on this edition of Inside Story. Email us your suggestions, insidestory at aljazeera.net. Bye-bye for now.